Okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay. No dirge tempo. <laughs> we'll see if we can keep it above a dirge. What's that? Hopefully there's testing. <laughs> so you got quiet real quick. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> exactly. I'm not going to be in front of the camera. That's right. That's right. That's the splash zone. <laughs> timer. Oh, it stopped. The pause. <laughs> We're going to start with a little blues jam today. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> that's right. We're going to riff a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Did you bring your sax? <laughs> Well, good morning. Still getting used to having to have a countdown before we begin. Um, but uh, great to have you here this morning. Uh, we look forward to having a wonderful service. I really, the only announcement that I have uh, this morning is just that we are not having a youth group this week. Uh, we'll pick that back up next week. And um, so you can just feel free to use your Thursday evening however you want. Um, uh, but with that, my only announcement, I'll just go ahead and open our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we are so, uh, so grateful uh, 
uh, to be able to, uh, to be your children. We are grateful to be able to be a part of your kingdom work here on earth. Uh, we're grateful to know uh, that you are sovereign, that you are in control of all things. Um, so uh, especially important for us to remember that, um, especially uh, during a time when it seems like so many things are not going the way that we would um, have planned them if we were in control. Um, things seem to be very much, uh, from our perspective, uh, out of control. And yet we know, even from within the the scope of recorded human history, really this is not anything that is uh, unusual or even all that extreme. Um, and yet you have demonstrated time and time again that you accomplish uh, your perfect plan in your way and in your time. And so it is very comforting for us to be able to trust you, to be able to know uh, that even though we cannot uh, see the future, we know what you have promised for our future. We know that for the believer, there is an eternity and glory that awaits us. We know that we will uh, forever be in your presence. We know that there will come a day when there will be no more uh, sin, sickness, or sadness. We know that we will be uh, filled with eternal joy and delight as we are able to uh, worship you in perfect harmony, um, unencumbered by our own sinfulness and our own shortcomings. Um, and we understand that we owe it all to you um, and to the work of your son, Jesus Christ. And so it is a great joy for us to be able to worship you. It's a great joy for us to be able to uh, fellowship with one another and participate together in worship. We ask that you would uh, use this service not only as an opportunity for us to declare our praises to you, but also so that our hearts might be drawn closer to you, that the power of your word would um, penetrate deep and would impact us in ways that are substantial and lasting, and that our lives would truly be transformed by it, and that the world that we interact with would see that there is a clear a distinction um, from how we live and how the rest of the world lives, that the uh, circumstances that tend to get other people um, uh, filled with fear and distress and worry. Um, it isn't that we don't care about those things, but we see them in their proper perspective. And we respond to them in ways that reflect our understanding of your not only control, but that your holiness as you control the world. Um, we ask that you would use us as powerful witnesses for you. May our lives and our words um, be used to... Um, to draw people to salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask your blessing on our service this morning, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, would you please stand and join us in singing this morning? Sing out, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship the whole. sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship. 
worship the holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing yeah. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Let's bless the Lord, church, sing it out, come on And bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. On that day, and on that day when my strength is. draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore forevermore sing it out bless the Lord oh my soul so worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship the holy name sing bless the lord and bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship the holy name. Oh, I worship Your holy name. Yes, we will. I worship Your holy. It's who you are. It's who 
Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, Judy, for the singing. Good to see everyone here today, as full as we like it to be. Of course, you all are welcome, and we just rejoice all the ones that are here. Okay, today we're going to be reading from the Gospel of John at the end of that Gospel, and we're going to be reading verses 3 to 24. Verse 3 to 24. Just a little bit of context. Jesus had already appeared to the apostles uh, twice before, and now he's appearing to them again, though initially they did not know it was him. Okay. Now it states here, starting in verse 4, Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. Now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. A disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging a net full of fish. They were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend 
my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This Jesus said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Amen. Shall 
seat. All right. Well, has anybody here ever had a hard time making a difficult decision? Anybody? Anybody relate? Well, I have great news for you. I mean, this is, I'm so glad you're here because, um, Apparently, there was an article written in Forbes magazine just two years ago with the title, How to Make Difficult Decisions and Live with the Consequences. And so I have done all the heavy lifting and read the article, and I will give you the three key takeaways, all right? So you're going to have it all buttoned up just right at the very beginning of this sermon. Um, Step number one, take inventory of your resources. Okay, so just look around and see what you got. Step number two, weigh the upside and the downside, all right? Just get that pros and cons list going, all right? So you're you're practically there to making this hard decision. And step number three, do the work, but know when to let go. Okay, how's that for ending on an ambiguous sort of like, uh, just good luck with that, guys. Yeah, we've all kind of faced that, right? We've got these difficult decisions. We have to do something, but maybe we are paralyzed. We don't know what to do. And part of the problem is having to live with the consequences. We know that whatever we decide to do, even if that decision is to do nothing, there are going to be consequences. And oftentimes we don't really know how we're going to handle that. Well, as we continue to look at Hebrews chapter 11, as the writer of Hebrews is explaining to us what it means to live by faith using the illustration of men and women from the history of the people of Israel, what we're going to see is that living by faith means dealing with the consequences of your actions being able to accept the consequences of being obedient to God. Because after all, if you remember, we talked about faith, you are stepping into the unknown, right? God has promised and he has commanded, but he has not given us really any more details than that. We simply have to accept his sovereign control and take action. And so when we do that, we are trusting that he is able to, he is able to provide for us. He is able to direct us. He is able to protect us. And so that in and of itself means that we have to be willing to endure whatever consequences may come through obedience to him. So the passage that we're going to look at this morning, Hebrews chapter 11, just three verses, verses 29 through 31, what we're going to see is three examples of accepting the consequences of living by faith. And these examples are given to us so that we might have courage to be obedient, even when being obedient seems to carry some very heavy consequences. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to read these three verses, verses 29, 30, and 31. So, by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, 
the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So in this instance, Rahab is really the only individual that's named. It's kind of a departure from the way that the writer of Hebrews has sort of set up this, these illustrations of living by faith, but yet he is still calling very heavily upon very familiar occurrences in the history of the people of Israel. Still sort of making his way from the exodus of Egypt, which is what we looked at last week, and now to some of the, um, the occurrences in their life as they departed from Egypt, and then even after they wandered in the wilderness and began to make their way into the land of Canaan. And so the first example is the example of the people of Israel sort of standing on the shores of the Red Sea with Pharaoh sort of breathing down their neck, wondering what are they supposed to do now. And what we see in this example is that accepting the consequences and living by faith means acting desperately. Acting desperately. Now this is a great example to us because the people of Israel, specifically the people of Israel in the exodus from Egypt, were not exactly shining examples of faith in God, are they, right? I mean, their, their whole demeanor is characterized by grumbling, complaining, arguing with Moses. In fact, their favorite expression is, would that we had died in Egypt, right? You've taken us out here just to die in the wilderness. I would have rather died in Egypt. You know, that seems to be sort of their big takeaway from God's delivering them from 400 years of captivity. I wish we had just died there. As far as they're concerned, despite the fact that they had witnessed the ten plagues that are just sort of beyond comprehension, despite the fact that they had been delivered from the angel of death by putting the blood over their doorposts, despite the fact that God had led them out of Egypt, they still have no confidence in God's ability to direct and protect them. They have no confidence in Moses' ability to lead them safely into the land of Canaan. They doubt, they doubt, they doubt, and then they doubt some more. And yet here they are, lifted up, as examples of what it means to live by faith. I mean, we think about the, some of the individuals that we have talked about just in this chapter. And imagine you are one of the, the initial audiences of this letter, and you've been, you've been sort of reintroduced to these familiar figures like Abraham and Moses and Noah. I mean, these, the shining examples of living by faith and then you've got, oh yeah, and let's not forget the whole nation of Israel being led out of Egypt in the Red Sea. And it might be kind of like, what are you talking about? I mean, this, these were not strong individuals of great faith. How in the world can they be examples to us of what it means to live by faith? And I think we have to be very careful and make sure that we pay attention to what this verse is doing here. This verse is not comparing the people of Israel with Abraham, or the people of Israel with Noah, or Moses, or Enoch, or Sarah, any of those individuals. It's comparing their faith with the Egyptians. That's the contrast made here. That is the point that we are supposed to sort of hone in on. These are not people of great and grand faith, they are quite literally people of little faith, but they did, in this instance, live by faith. Remember, one of Jesus' favorite descriptions of his own disciples is, Oh, you of little faith. I mean, you look in the Gospels and it seems like that's his favorite thing to call them. You of little faith. The Hebrew readers have been shown what it means to live by faith by these individuals of great faith. And I think sometimes when you do that, when you compare people to sort of the superstars, 
it can be very easy to then just to say, well, I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to be able to have that level of faith. Then I'm going to build a boat for a hundred years when it's never even rained. I, I'm not going to have that kind of faith. I'm not going to have the kind of faith where I'm going to take my son up onto a mountain and prepare to sacrifice him, trusting that God is going to provide a solution to this. I, I'm never going to have that kind of faith. So I think the writer of Hebrews is sort of throttling it back and saying, well, can you at least have faith like the people of Israel for this one brief moment of time? Do you think you could do that? Could you live by faith that way? Maybe just to give them a little encouragement that God isn't asking them to move. God isn't asking them to be these superstars. He's just asking them to have a little faith. I think it's important for us also to realize it's so easy to think that if I have doubted or if I've been a person of extreme doubt in the past, that there is no hope for me of living by faith. And these individuals are an example of that, that the doubt that you have had in the past does not have to characterize your life forever. You can get victory over that. I mean, they might be deep, lasting, troubling doubts, doubts that you have wrestled with for years, things that have kept you awake at night, that kind of doubt, the where is God kind of doubts, the have you taken us out in the wilderness just to die kind of doubts. You can have that level of doubt and still be transformed into men and women who live by faith. Can you relate to those kind of doubts? I mean, let's just think about Peter. I mean, we read a little bit about him and his interaction with the risen Savior, but he was a man who sort of swung on this pendulum of extremes. I mean, even thinking about his life and the experiences leading up to the crucifixion and in the Garden of Gethsemane, He's the one pulling out the sword, wanting to, you know, have at the Roman soldiers and chopping ears off. He goes from that extreme to completely, you know, running and hiding and denying Jesus Christ. I mean, an example of extreme doubt. And then he swings completely the other way. He moves from sort of self-reliance to doubt and then doubt to reliance on his Savior. And in that sort of brokenhearted moment that we just read about, just saying, you know that I love you. And Jesus basically just saying, then be obedient. Feed my sheep. That's all you got to do. And he did that. He was then a man who led the early church and led them boldly, even to the point of being martyred himself. Don't think that just because you have had doubts in the past or maybe you even have doubts right now, that you cannot be a man or woman, boy or girl, who lives by faith. I think even of someone like C.S. Lewis, I mean, who lived most of his life as an atheist, and then later into his adulthood, became convinced of the truth of the gospel and became you know, almost someone we regard as an apologist and a defender of the faith. What happened to the people of, of Israel? How did they go from saying, why did you bring us out here just to die, to then being individuals who were able to live by faith? Well, if you turn to Exodus chapter 14, you'll see one of the charges in verse 13 of chapter 14 that Moses gives to these individuals, this whole group of individuals, hundreds of thousands of individuals as they are standing on the banks of the Red Sea looking out over what seems to be an uncrossable obstacle as they are being pursued by what appears to be an undefeatable army. 
And Moses says to them in verse 13, Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. You don't have to do anything. You don't even have to say a word. Just trust God, and he will deliver you. And so what happened to Israel is they got desperate. They got desperate enough to listen to Moses and obey God. They had no choice, really. They were not going to get across the Red Sea. They were not going to defeat the Egyptians. The only option they were left with was trust God or die. That's a pretty desperate situation. But do you realize that is the situation that every individual in the entire world who has ever lived exists under? Trust God or die. Trust God or be crushed by the consequences of your sins. Trust in God to provide for you salvation from this or you will surely die. And so what Exodus chapter 14 tells us is that they, in that moment of time, lived by faith. And God moved the pillar of cloud that normally he led them with to the rear to block the Egyptians from pursuing them any farther. And then he enabled Moses to part the Red Sea and they walked through on dry land while the Egyptians were held at bay And then the Egyptians were released, and the Egyptians pursued them, but God thwarted their efforts. Exodus tells us that he caused the chariot's wheels to be clogged up so that they could not drive fast, and then the Egyptians panicked, and the seas closed in over them, and they were all destroyed. If you have difficulty living by faith, maybe it's just that you aren't desperate enough yet. Maybe you're still living in in the hopes that some other solution is going to be the deliverer of your problems. Your financial security is going to be able to protect you. The strength of your family ties is going to keep you safe. The the, the security of the and stability of the government you live under is going to be able to protect you. Maybe you're just living depending, in other words, putting your faith in something or someone other than God. You just aren't desperate enough yet to trust God. Maybe that's the reason for 2020. God to just sort of tear down all of those objects in which we have been entrusting ourselves for safety and security, causing us to realize we have no other choice but to live desperately, to live obediently to him, to live by faith. There is no other option. Is he trying to show you that the earthly resources that you lean on for strength and support really are like cotton candy? And they just smash, put a little water on it, and it's gone. Those things are all going to fail you. Are you desperate enough to accept the consequences of living by faith and being obedient to God? That's what I think we, we learn from the people of Israel standing before the Red Sea, having no other choice but to live by faith and trust that God is going to protect them from the Egyptians, that he's going to hold back the water while we pass through. He is going to deliver us, but we have to live by faith. I mean, there's also a warning in this passage too. 
As important as it is to realize that just because you have lived in doubt your whole life doesn't mean you cannot live by faith right now. It is also important for us to realize that just because you have a little bit of faith at a single moment in history does not mean that faith is going to be sufficient to carry you through for the rest of your life. The, the call to live by faith is a daily call. Is a call to continue in faith. And why would I call your, our attention to that reality? Because even as we look at what the writer of Hebrews draws our attention to, he has to go 40 years into the future after the Red Sea before he can find another illustration of the people of Israel living by faith. He has to let the whole generation that was led out of Egypt die off in the wilderness until they are entering into the Canaan land, not under Moses' leadership, but under Joshua's leadership, before he can give them another example of their kinsmen living by faith. I mean, if you think about it, the waters of the Red Sea have scarcely closed over the Egyptians before the people of Israel are creating a golden calf to worship, saying that this is the God that has led you out of Egypt. I mean, it, it, the memory of that deliverance still has to be clearly pounded into their minds when they are doing that while Moses is up on Mount Sinai. And why do they do it? Well, Moses has been up there too long. They want something they can see. They want something that they can feel. They want something that they can look at and point to and say, hey, there's our God right there. In other words, they don't want to live by faith. At least they don't want to live by faith in a God they can't see. How often do we kind of treat God that way? We, we live by faith for a moment. We see God, um, we see God protect us and support us and strengthen us and encourage us and lift us up. And then another hardship comes, and we start this sort of bizarre bargaining with God. If you do this, God, then I'll do this for you the rest of my life. If you just get me out of this next jam, then I will serve you the rest of my life. And maybe you even have a situation where God does deliver you from that. And it's not the rest of your life. It's barely the week is over before you're already doubting him again you're already living for yourself. You're already serving your own self-interests again. It happens all the time. I mean, I think that's what we are meant to see in the history of Israel, is that the Israelites, they're, they're us. We doubt. We accuse. We turn our backs on God, just as they do, so easily. And so what do they get? They get exactly what they have been accusing God of doing to them. They accuse God of dragging them out into the wilderness to die. So guess what? They get to die in the wilderness. They don't get to go into the promised land. It's the next generation that will do that. And that's verse 30. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30 by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. So if the people of Israel on the Red Sea encourage us to realize that accepting the consequences of living by faith means acting desperately, the people defeating the Jericho help us to see that living by faith means accepting the consequences and acting outrageously. God has asked Israel to do some strange things throughout her history. But probably none so strange as how he instructed them to defeat the city of Jericho. Jericho was a strategic location. There's a reason why there was a city there. There's a reason why whenever Jericho was defeated, they built another city up on top of it. It really represented sort of the front gate into the land of Canaan. 
It was not a huge city. I mean, when we think of Jericho in our minds, we should be thinking maybe more like large medieval castle rather than this sort of booming metropolis. But what they were known for is they had very robust walls. So they had cisterns full of water and food supplies inside. And so when armies invaded, they could simply close up the walls, run inside, and just outlast whoever would attack. Nobody could break down the walls. What you had to do in order to defeat a city like Jericho is you had to build siege ramps to go up over the walls. And usually you had to do that by just piling up rocks. And depending on how tall the walls were and how big your army was, that could take weeks to months to build siege ramps to get up over the walls and attack the city. God didn't say, hey, Joshua, when you get in there, you guys just better be prepared to stack rocks for a long time if you're going to be able to overthrow Jericho. So you're going to have some blisters on your hands. You know, you might lose a couple fingernails in the process. But you know what? It's going to be worth it. So just stick to it. Just stay strong. Eventually, you're going to have the city of Jericho. No, he didn't do that. He didn't even so much to say, just throw pillows at it, you know? What did God have him do? Just march around it. That's all you got to do. For seven days, first six days, just go around it one time. On the seventh day, why don't you go ahead and march around it seven times and then, and then blow your trumpets and shout really loud. That's all you got to do. It'll be yours. I love what the church father Chrysostom says. He says, he summed it up well and he says, Assuredly, the sound of trumpets is unable to cast down stones, though one blow for 10,000 years. But by faith, you can do all things. It really wasn't even the trumpets that caused the walls to... It wasn't some sort of harmonic resonance that caused the rocks to crack and that sort of thing. No. God just said, just just show a little faith and you will defeat the city. It might seem completely ridiculous to march around this city. They might mock you. They might jeer at you. They might think you are out of your mind. But that's okay. If you are obedient, if you live by faith, the city will be yours. So this generation, this second generation, did what the first generation, the one that had seen the miraculous signs of God that had been delivered through the Red Sea, that saw him provide supernaturally food for them every day, the, the, the generation that had saw him give them water out of rocks. I mean, they had had opportunity to see miracle after miracle. They are not the ones that had the faith to enter in and defeat Jericho. They had to die in the wilderness. Why? Well, because when they got not to the edge of the Red Sea, but when they got to the land of Canaan, instead of going in, they decided, hey, let's send some people in just to check things out. So they sent in 12 spies. The spies came back. And if you remember the song from your Sunday school, 10 were bad and 2 were good. And the 10 reported, oh, it's terrible. There's giants in the land. The cities are just so strong and powerful. There's no way we're going to be able to defeat them. And so what did they say? Would that we had died in Egypt, right? They came back with their favorite saying, you know, oh, we got all the way to Canaan. Oh, I can't believe it. I wish we'd just died in Egypt. Joshua and Caleb, the two good spies who bring back good reports. This is what they say in Numbers 14, verse 9. Kind of, crying out to the people like, do you realize how dumb you're being? They said, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed for them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. 
It's very similar to what Moses had used to challenge the people of God to live by faith and move out across the Red Sea when he said that the, that the Lord would fight for them, that they don't even need to speak a word. But Joshua and Caleb were like, look, these people, it doesn't matter how big they are, it doesn't matter how tall the walls are, that they're like bread for us. God has promised this land and he is going to deliver it to us. We don't even have to go in and do it for ourselves. He's going to do it for us. We just have to obey him and live by faith. Living by faith is to trust God, that God will do exactly as he promised, no matter how formidable the opposition no matter how ridiculous the command he gives you is. And I feel like that is so often why we are so weak in our evangelism, is we just don't want to look ridiculous. We just don't want to sound ridiculous. But the people of Israel, as they entered Canaan and they approached Jericho, showed us that living by faith is being willing to accept acting outrageously and looking ridiculous if it means obeying the Lord. Maybe a word of encouragement for you young people here, or maybe not even you young people, but people who were not raised by strong, godly parents. Maybe you were raised by unbelieving parents. Maybe you were raised by parents who professed to be Christians, but lived hypocritical lives, lived lives that were completely contrary to what they claimed to believe. There's encouragement here that your faith is not dependent on the faith of your parents. And I think so often we use that to challenge young people not to lean on the faith of their parents and just believe that because their parents were godly individuals, therefore they are as well. But I would say the second generation of Israelites after um, the exodus from Egypt helps us to see that just because your parents were not men and women of faith doesn't mean you can't be. And so these individuals were able to do what their parents were not able to. Where their parents had doubt, they were able, able to follow Joshua and Caleb's leadership and enter into the land and be obedient to God's promises. They certainly were not perfect. They certainly had their fair share of shortcomings. But they show that living by faith and being willing to act, um, act ridiculously, being willing to act outrageously, isn't dependent on the strength of the generation that came before them. So they obeyed, and God delivered the city into their hands. The walls came tumbling down. Lastly, verse 31. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had been given a friendly welcome to the spies. The third point is that living by faith means accepting the consequences and acting decisively. I mean, I don't really know if the writer of Hebrews is just trying to dunk on the people of Israel of the Exodus, but he's making this contrast, almost sort of showing they've got a little faith, but not only was the second generation stronger of faith than they were, But there was even a prostitute in the city of Jericho that had more faith than they did. In other words, everyone can live by faith. Your backstory is not the deciding factor. What was the basis of Rahab's faith? Uh, We find out her faith is explained in Joshua chapter 2, verse 9. Let me just read that verse for you. Joshua chapter 2, verse 9. Rahab says to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land 
and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you, before when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Ammonites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Rahab had faith because of what she had heard. She had heard two things that the people of Israel had done, and probably sort of not firsthand either. It probably came through the grapevine. Hey, did you hear what happened at the Red Sea? The Israelites were backed up against it, and the Egyptians were coming after them, and the sea parted, and they crossed and the Egyptians were drowned in the sea. Hey, did you hear what the Israelites did to the Ammonite kings Sihon and Og? And their con- her conclusion was not, oh, the Israelites must be a strong and mighty people. We better be afraid of them. No, her conclusion was, the Israelites have a strong and mighty God. A God who is Lord of heaven and Lord of the earth below. Her her faith was in the God of the people of Israel, not in the Israelites. Her faith was that if God could do that at the Red Sea to the Egyptian army, if God could do that to the Ammonites, then he certainly will have no trouble doing that to us. It doesn't matter how big our walls are. It doesn't matter how deep our cisterns are or how much food is in our storehouses. We will not be able to outlast or overpower the Israelites because their God is too strong for us. He is more powerful than anything I can comprehend. So no doubt it was a risk for Rahab to hide the spies, but she was willing to accept the consequences. She was willing to accept the risk of hiding them because she feared the God of the people of Israel more than she feared the consequences. And so she acted decisively. I'm going to protect these men. I'm going to hide them. I'm going to make sure that they get out of the city safely. And so she is given to us, not just here. She's a woman that pops up throughout Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament. She's the mother of somebody you might know of as Boaz, who was the husband of Ruth, which means she is like the great, great, great grandmother of King David. She is in the line of Jesus She is a significant figure in biblical history. And we know about her because she lived by faith. She was a prostitute. Not only was she from a pagan nation, but she was engaged in some pretty wicked behavior before her encounter with the God of Israel. And over the centuries, many commentators have tried to soften this and tried to say, well, that really means that she was, uh, she was a housekeeper. She worked in their houses or that she was a, a lady's maid or, you know, just she, they try to like sort of uh, dis, just make this seem like, you know, she was really not that bad. I love what Philip Hughes and, and commentator says, he says, there is not the slightest need to seek some means of toning down the description of Rahab as a harlot, 
as though it were inappropriate for one so designated to be included in a catalog of believers. I think that is so important for, under, for us to understand. Because if we have to tone down Rahab, then that means that God is not interested in saving sinners. That means he's interested in saving people who are pretty good. That those are the kind of people he's interested in saving. But that isn't the message of the gospel at all. I mean, think about what the Apostle Paul tells Peter, or not Peter, tells Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The Apostle Paul understands that the grace of God that is displayed to us through Jesus Christ is not because we are okay people. It's because we are all just like Rahab. Our lives are soaked in terrible sin. And we cannot save ourselves. We do not deserve saving. There's no amount of toning down the characteristics of our lives that will somehow make us acceptable in the eyes of God. The only way that we find acceptance in the eyes of God is through the grace and mercy displayed to us by Jesus Christ, through his sinless life, through his death on the cross, and his resurrection. And Rahab may have lived thousands of years before Christ entered into this world, but yet she, just like everyone else, would have become a believer by believing in the coming of this Messiah that the God of the Israelites was going to provide. She would have learned through accepting of their, uh, the ceremonial rituals of the sacrificial system. She would have learned through the prophets. She would have learned through the writings of Moses that God was there going to send someone who would save sinners from their sins, not who would save people who were pretty good already from their few minor imperfections. I think it should come to us as a great source of hope when Scripture tells us that Rahab was a prostitute. And yet she is an individual that God saved by His mercy and grace and didn't just save and then sort of stash her in the corner to be forgotten about. Don't worry about her over there. And he really brings her front and center into his redemptive plan. She is not a source of shame in the gospel story. In fact, she is a point of great hope for us. And so when we look at Rahab and we consider her, that yes, we see that she acted decisively, that she was willing to accept whatever consequences may come to her because she realized that she had more to gain by following the God of the people of Israel than she had to gain by ratting them out and hoping somehow they would be able to overpower him. She knew that was an impossibility. And I think so often we live our lives with the exact opposite belief. We believe that all the people around us who want nothing to do with Christianity, who want to harass and who want to mock, that somehow they are more powerful, that somehow they can do more harm to us than God can do good. So we live in fear of them rather than live in obedient reverence to God. Rahab is a reminder that we don't have to live that way. So, you can act decisively, and you can act outrageously, and you can act desperately. All of those are signs that you are willing to accept the consequences of living by faith. And I think the willingness to accept the consequences of being obedient and living by faith is one of the surest signs of living by faith. Let's pray.
Dear Lord, we do thank you so much for the testimony of these, this individual and these groups of individuals. And we rejoice that even though uh, the Israelites at the Red Sea had little faith, they did have faith. According to your word, they acted by faith. And that is an encouragement to us because we so often feel like we have very little faith. We're encouraged by the testimony of the second generation of Israelites after the Exodus, seeing that they were able to do what their parents were not, that they believed and entered the land of Canaan, believing that you had provided it for them, and that it was theirs to have, and so they were obedient to you, being willing to really act outrageously. And we thank you also for the testimony of Rahab, someone who had so very little exposure to you up to this point, at least that she was aware of, and yet just by hearing of how you had delivered your people from Egypt and had given them the ability to defeat powerful kings, she understood that they must serve a powerful God, a powerful God who could not be overcome. And so she lived by faith and acted decisively. May their example serve to strengthen and encourage our own faith. May we be willing to be unafraid and to accept whatever consequences may come so long as we are obedient to you, trusting you for the ultimate outcome, not being fearful of what others may say or do to us. And may our lives then in turn be a powerful testimony to those who may come after us. We ask all this in your name. Amen. All right, well, hopefully you'll have a wonderful Sunday. Uh, Look forward to next week. John will be preaching next week, so excited to hear what the Lord has laid on his heart uh, to bring to us. So have a wonderful Sunday, and God bless.